Dead Space 3 is the quintessential example of a publisher meddling with a franchise and destroying it in the process, along with the developer in this case. You probably know the story already. The first two Dead Space games were critically acclaimed but didn't sell that well, not by big publisher standards anyway. EA greenlit a third game, however it demanded core changes in order to hit sales and revenue targets that were even more inflated than Ellie's new breasts. Seriously, where the hell did these things come from? According to EA, the third Dead Space game had to be action focused to appeal to a wider audience. It had to have some kind of multiplayer to limit secondhand sales, and of course it had to have microtransactions. Surprising absolutely no one except overpaid EA executives, this approach didn't work. The shift to a heavy action focus didn't suit anyone. Fans of the first two games largely liked the series for its horror elements, whereas fans of action games would immediately notice that the movement and shooting mechanics were not designed with action in mind. The co-op campaign was cobbled together late in development and is distracting both when playing solo or when playing with a friend. And no one likes microtransactions. Dead Space 3 ended up as the worst reviewed game of the three main entries, although it still did better than it deserved in my opinion, and it did not meet the 5 million sales target. Cut to 2017 and EA officially closes Visceral Games for the crime of doing exactly what it was told to do. Okay, that is simplifying it a bit, but genuinely this is one of those rare occasions where the capital G gamer narrative is actually fairly accurate. The Dead Space franchise is dead, and yeah, it is EA's fault. I honestly did not expect the problems of Dead Space 3's development to be so obvious and black and white. When I started researching this video, I expected to find a slightly more nuanced chain of events than the usual EA bad narrative you see online. I was sure EA had made mistakes, but I didn't expect it to be the Disney villain that gamers had portrayed it as, both on the release of this game and on the eventual closure of Visceral. I'm now used to anonymous forum posts spreading across the internet and getting regurgitated by people with large audiences until baseless rumours become accepted as fact, like that whole thing about there being another ending to Mass Effect 3 planned by the original writer, and how big bad Casey Hudson came in, threw it away and did his own thing. It's not really true, but people say it with such certainty that you can't help but be taken in sometimes. I went looking for shades of grey but didn't find any. The situation with Dead Space 3 is actually as simple as it sounds. Now Visceral does bear responsibility for some of Dead Space 3's problems, notably terrible writing and a mess of a story, which isn't really anything to do with EA. However, it was undeniably pressured into making a game it didn't want to make, and then punished for following orders. Dead Space 3's problems were obvious straight away. Early trailers and promotional materials focused on the action and new cover shooter mechanics which immediately put EA on the defensive, having to promise fans that Dead Space 3 was still a horror game and they had just made a few tweaks in the name of accessibility. This part makes me a little angry because it's a total misuse of the term accessibility. What EA actually meant was it made changes in the name of mainstream popularity. It wanted as big an audience as possible and it believed the audience for a cover shooter was bigger than that of a horror game. There's nothing particularly accessible about Dead Space 3. It's not notably any easier or harder with the same selection of difficulty options available, there are still a bunch of button mashing QTEs which many people struggle with, and they can't be turned off. There's nothing accessible about Dead Space 3, it just slots into a more mainstream genre. This is not the game Visceral wanted to make. Now frankly that's obvious enough just from looking at the previous two games, however we also have a Eurogamer interview of Ben Wanat, the game's creative director, that reveals the original plan for the third game, which would have focused on the hallucinations and dementia brought about by the markers, with Isaac Clarke seeing a shadow version of himself during the game. This shadow would have been the second player in the co-op campaign, and both players would have seen things that the other didn't, leading to potential debate about what was real and what was a hallucination. The crafting system would have tapped into Isaac's engineering abilities a little more, instead of just having a workbench operate as a glorified 3D printer. While we should be wary about reading too much into vague outlines of what a game could have been, again just look at the whole dark energy fiasco around Mass Effect 3 for an example, there is ample evidence that Visceral could have pulled this off by looking at its work in the previous two games and even the DLC for this one. Speaking of things Visceral didn't want to do, there's the microtransactions, pre-order bonuses and exclusive content. Let's face it, no developer gets into the business of making games because they love creating microtransaction economies or special suits for those who purchase the game from GameStop. It's tacky, obnoxious and a horrible way to treat those who are shelling out $60 for your product. Even now, more than 7 years after release, the Origin store still has a full collection of boosters, resources, weapons and suits for you to buy for micro or in some cases fairly macro amounts of real money. And these microtransactions do impact gameplay as well. 
Now just because you may not need them doesn't mean some people won't be tempted or feel like the game is pushing them to spend more money. Fortunately, the microtransaction economy here isn't as sexy and appealing as it is in modern games. EA hadn't quite mastered the manipulative science behind getting people to spend more money at this point. There's a big difference between modern loot crates and these in-game descriptions that still have the HTML tags in them. Still, Dead Space 3 was peak EA when it came to marketing deals and microtransactions, and this underlying greed permeated all the advertising and the build-up to release and discussion of the game once it was out. The microtransaction model might not be the biggest problem with the game, but it does perfectly illustrate EA's desire to squeeze every penny from the game it released, and that money-hungry attitude clearly contributed to the failure of the game, and eventually the studio. I'll discuss the closure of Visceral more at the end of the video. For now, let's look at how EA messed up the game itself. In my video on Dead Space 2, I discussed how the game veered heavily towards the action-horror end of the spectrum. There weren't many moments of fear or genuine tension, although the bits it did have were pretty epic, like when you were trapped in a circular room with a bunch of Velociraptor-esque things with nowhere to hide. I got the impression the devs did still want to make a horror game, they just lost their way a bit under pressure to up the ante from the first game. Dead Space 3 doesn't even try to be a horror game. There's one jump scare that I can recall, and the one section that felt genuinely tense seems to have been an accident given that it's never capitalised on. Dead Space 3 is an out-and-out -out action game, there's no denying it. The problems are immediately apparent. For example, there's no subtle build-up to the threat. Even the prologue, which seems designed to act as a tutorial to the basic combat and movement for series newcomers, starts by throwing three fairly fast-moving necromorphs at you by way of introduction. Playing as a new character is a great opportunity to show players how dangerous even slow-moving necromorphs can be when you're unprepared. Sure, Clark and series veterans know how to handle the enemies, but the new character and new players don't. And yet, Johnny New Guy kills the necromorphs easily and doesn't even need to be told to shoot the limbs off three times. If this guy had survived, we wouldn't be in the mess we're in now. This pattern continues throughout the rest of the game. Enemies are thrown at you in huge numbers, with no subtlety or thought put into how the interactions could be made scary. For example, you rarely hear the threat before you see it. There's no attempt to build up tension before new encounters, apart from a couple of exceptions. And enemies always appear in huge numbers. The whole thing becomes predictable, and predictability and horror are not a great combination. You know how in a cover shooter when you walk into a new room with loads of conveniently placed cover and you're like, okay, shit is about to go down in here. And conversely, there are points where you know you're safe to explore and solve puzzles. Well, it's like that in Dead Space 3. You walk into a room and you know that you're about to be attacked by a couple of waves of necromorphs. Likewise, when you're in most corridors or narrow locations, you know you're safe, because for reasons we'll get to shortly, single enemies pose no threat in Dead Space 3. You'll never be walking down the corridor scared about what might be around the corner, or whether something will jump out at you from the ceiling. Enemies are only a threat in massive groups, and you can't fit massive groups in narrow corridors, so the game doesn't usually bother trying. There isn't much enemy variation either. Actually, technically, I think there are a lot of different variations of Necromorph based on different types of soldiers that were taken over, but they don't feel like different variants because they aren't especially distinctive. Even the basic enemies pose more of a threat than your average Necromorph from the previous games. Slashers and the poison-spewing pukers are everywhere now, and they even come in souped-up variants like these pukers who charge at you, because god forbid there be any enemies that you can deal with at range. The first game in particular had necromorph variants that were not only visually distinctive, they acted in completely different ways, posed unique threats, and required actual tactics to eliminate. I still remember most of the enemy types, how they attacked and how I needed to kill them, and even in what order. For example, the pregnant were slow and numbering, however you had to be careful when shooting because if you blew open their bellies, a bunch of swarmers would leap out to attack. Pregnant make what is almost a cameo appearance here, and strangely the swarmers seem to burst out on the death of the pregnant even if you do only shoot off the limbs. Remember the invincible enemy that kept regenerating after you'd killed it and you had to use the environment to trap it in a cryogenic chamber or blast it with a rocket engine? Well, that enemy is back with friends this time, except you can't do anything to kill them, you just knock them down and run off. And you never feel like you're being haunted by them either. They don't technically follow you or chase you as such, it's so easy to run away from them that the game cheats and spawns them in at nearby access points like vents to make it feel like you're being chased, when you're clearly not. The Twitchers make a return here and are one of the few enemy types given a good introduction. You see a Twitcher in the distance a couple of times but he disappears so fast it's almost blink and you'll miss him. I anticipated a big fight and yet when we did go head to head he was fairly easy to freeze with stasis and then kill. 
As if to confirm that this enemy was not that big a deal after all, the game immediately, and I really do mean immediately, throws five more of them at you. This isn't like when you face an early game boss and then have to fight two of them together near the end of the game. This is five more straight after the first fight, and that first fight had been built up as a big deal. Adding more enemies is the only way the game knows how to up the stakes. It does the same thing with the big alien necromorphs. They aren't that hard to beat if you have stasis, although they can take a fair bit of damage. They aren't much of a threat by themselves despite looking intimidating. They simply don't have the moveset to trouble you late in the game, especially if you do have stasis. Perhaps realising this, the game just throws up its hands and makes you fight a group of six, because why not? There's one cool enemy type called feeders that you don't have to fight if you can stay quiet and sneak past them. I just wish I'd discovered this fact sooner. I thought they were the same as the pack from Dead Space 2 and I assumed they'd charge at me as a pack sooner or later. In such huge numbers they can pose a significant threat, so I really regret not figuring out the stealth thing until later on. I wasted more ammo on these things than I care to think about. I suppose there is one more enemy type, humans. However, the sum of their contribution is making Visceral squeeze in a half assed cover system. Clark can duck down and press up against some pieces of cover, although strangely not all of them. If there's a way to tell what is actually cover and what isn't, then it certainly passed me by. There's no good way to move between pieces of cover, there's no vaulting over them, and no dashing into nearby cover. It's just a few large rocks that you might be able to hide behind to catch your breath. Occasionally you'll see dynamic fights break out between humans and necromorphs, which looks good. However, just as often the humans awkwardly ignore the necromorphs and keep shooting at you. There's also a new roll move, which can be useful if you find yourself surrounded or for avoiding charge attacks from some of the bigger enemies. It's still somewhat clunky and I'd often roll in the wrong direction, but it's a start. Thing is, for all the slight movement tweaks the sequels have made, Clark is still at heart the same slow, clumbering guy he was in the first game, because he was designed for horror, not action. He can't hip fire, and movement animations take a long time to play out. You can't suddenly shove him into a third person shooter, add a roll move, and hope no one notices. With such limited movement, you'd be excused for expecting Dead Space 3 to be incredibly difficult, but it's not much different to the first two. I'd say it starts off harder than the other games, but ends easier. Visceral overcompensated for the restrictive movement by making the guns way too powerful. Who needs agile movement if the enemies never reach you in the first place? There aren't fixed guns this time around. Instead, you can basically craft whatever the hell you want at the benches dotted around the levels. You still start with the famous Plasma Cutter, which is my favourite gun in the series due to how focused it is on dismembering limbs. However, everything else you have to make yourself. At first, it's a little overwhelming. There are different frames to choose from, various models like the Tesla cores, Plasma Core, Military Engine, and then attachments and secondary fire modes, plus a bunch of upgrades you can add on. It took me a while to realise just how insane you can make the guns. I made guns like an assault rifle that fired electrified rounds with a rocket launcher on the bottom, a shotgun that fired acid rounds with a grenade launcher attached, and a disc ripper combined with a flamethrower. Even my basic plasma cutter, which I kept on me at all times, had a stasis coating to slow enemies down as I shot them. I barely touched the sides with what you could do though. There's nothing stopping you having a second disc ripper on your disc ripper or a shotgun attached to your shotgun. It's pretty insane, like an episode of Pimp My Gun or something. The flexibility is great, however the process of experimenting and playing around with the weapons is really tedious. You can remove attachments but it means constantly swapping guns back into one of the two inventory slots for weapons and it's just a bit of a pain. I also think the bench detracts from the atmosphere a bit. The first game went to great lengths to establish the weapons first and foremost as tools that Isaac was well suited to because he was an engineer. He knew how to use things like plasma cutters, disc rippers and force guns because he was trained on them. I discussed this a lot in the Dead Space video and I still think it stands out as great world building. In the third game you slot any old pieces together and a 3D printer spits them out for you if you have enough materials. You can also find blueprints for special pre-made weapons. They have weird names and are described as a team favourite or great for co-op. I try not to bang on about immersion too much but these descriptions do detract from the atmosphere a bit. Horror games don't need to be self-serious all the time, but this kind of accidental fourth wall breaking doesn't work for me. With all the weapon options, it's a shame that the weapon inventory has been cut down from four to two. I was reluctant to experiment with new guns because that new gun becomes 50% of your available weapons until you reach another bench. 
Sure, if you get creative, you could argue that each gun is really two guns because of the way the attachments work, but then there were always alternative fire modes anyway, so that logic kind of applies to the previous games too. Whichever way you look at it, you have half the options now. I ended up carrying my plasma cutter on me at all times and then having an experimental weapon as the other choice, which I would regularly switch out. This is not the optimal way to play by any stretch, but it just kind of felt right to me. I assume the reduced inventory space has something to do with the inclusion of co-op. If you're playing with a friend then obviously you have access to four weapons between the two of you. The simple solution would be to have four weapon slots for single player and two for co-op. Only two weapon slots is really restrictive for single player. The huge choice of weapons combined with the limited amount you can actually carry also has a knock on effect for enemy encounters. The game can't ever assume you'll have access to certain weapon types or damage buffs. When playing the Resident Evil games, I would make decisions on what weapons and ammo to carry based on the enemies I would expect to fight. Sometimes acid rounds are more useful than flame rounds for example. Dead Space 3 can never allow for that kind of planning because there's a good chance the player won't have acid rounds or the electrical rounds or whatever. This reduces those enhancements to being basic damage buffs. There are slight distinctions to each damage type but it's subtle. I think electrical damage is more likely to make enemies stagger and acid stacks more than fire. Weirdly poison enemies who you might expect to be invulnerable to acid damage do still take extra damage from those rounds, but it doesn't apply damage over time to those enemies. I must admit my insistence on keeping the plasma cutter in my inventory all the time probably made life a little harder, but I was desperate to cling on to Dead Space's roots as a horror game. I also, naively, assumed that shooting off limbs would still be the best way to kill enemies. Isaac does specifically tell his colleagues to do that, however I swear it doesn't matter all that much anymore. While you have less space in your inventory for guns, you have a lot more room for ammo thanks to the switch to a single ammo resource. I don't like this. I suppose for some guns it makes sense, but it's a bit silly for guns like the disc gripper to use the same ammo as an assault rifle. Oh and the grenade launcher on the shotgun uses the same ammo as the shotgun itself, as does the flamethrower attachment. It's silly and means you never have to make decisions about what ammo to carry, not to mention you'll have loads of space for more med packs than you'll ever need. Despite all the options for weapons, I didn't find as many that I enjoy using. For example, I used to love the disc ripper. In the previous games, it was a great weapon for up close encounters, and I loved holding that disc out in front and just watching the horde enemies like the pack run right into it and die. In Dead Space 3, it's slightly harder to justify carrying a weapon like the disc ripper because it's only useful in very specific situations, and with only two weapons on hand at any time, you might not want to take up a valuable space with it. Worst of all though, the changes in enemy behaviour mean it's just not as useful. Enemies rarely stagger when you deal damage now and they keep attacking even when a disc is literally ripping them to shreds. If you get hit while holding a disc in front of you, Isaac drops the disc and so you have to use a new one. This happens so often that it's, well, probably just not worth doing. The enemies are simply too fast in both movement and attack to make this weapon viable, and that's a shame because it's fun to use. But on the other hand, you can create some great combinations, like having a force gun mixed with an assault rifle which lets you knock enemies away first to get a bit of breathing room before then taking them out. Or I suppose you could just use a shotgun which has knocked back and deals damage at the same time, but that's probably not as fun. And to be honest, even the shotgun has limits up close. The lack of a hip fire option means you always have to aim when sometimes you'd rather just shoot everything in front of you. The shotgun has a surprisingly narrow spread and aiming it when surrounded by enemies leads to the odd scenario where you basically miss everything even though that should be nearly impossible. None of the Dead Space games have excelled at level design, although the first two games had their moments. The claustrophobic confines of the Ishimura in Dead Space 1 made for a great location reminiscent of the mansion in Resident Evil 1, on paper at least. However, the actual level design within the ship did leave a lot to be desired. It was incredibly linear and not linked together in a satisfying way, so you were nearly always just pushing forward through levels except for the odd detour to pick up a piece of loot. Still, the ship itself had a lot of personality and I consider it a memorable location. Dead Space 2 was inconsistent, it probably had the most memorable locations in the series with brightly lit shopping malls, basketball courts and spooky temples, but it had a lot of fluff in between, and its attempts to connect areas up with shortcuts was kind of half assed Then we get to Dead Space 3, which is unfortunately the weakest of the bunch. In many ways it's reminiscent of Dead Space 1 because much of it takes place in narrow and shockingly repetitive corridors. This was somewhat forgivable in Dead Space 1 because you were on one ship the entire time, but Dead Space 3 takes place across multiple settings and really doesn't need to be this boring. 
There's a decent chunk of backtracking as well, so you get to traipse through these corridors at least twice. It's not the good kind of backtracking either, where you open up a new door that acts as a shortcut to a previous area. It's literally just going back the same way you came, with enemies attacking you in the same places they attacked before. The level design is frustrating because there are glimpses of what could have been. Near the end you get to explore a long dead alien civilization, which looks glorious even if it also does have quite a bit of backtracking. There are key codes to find based on the alien language, lots of awe-inspiring monuments and some cool alien technology. I wish this area had been a bigger part of the game. It's by far the most interesting environment, so it's a shame it's just shoved in near the end without enough time to breathe. I also liked the snow environment above ground, however again it feels like a tease of what could have been. You might not think such a brightly lit white environment would suit horror, but the use of snowstorms can absolutely mess with your vision just as much as darkness. There's one scene where you are completely lost with no objective markers. You have to stick close to fires for warmth and use flares to get around. This section only lasts a few minutes and there aren't many enemies to fight. Those that do appear just burst from the ground in front of you, which isn't scary at all. However, it's not hard to imagine this being a bigger and scarier part of the experience. You could have necromorphs stumbling out of the snow a few feet from you instead of loudly erupting from the ground. Then you'd fight them while sticking close to the fires to keep warm and just generally trying not to get lost. I wish more of the game had taken place in the snow during these extreme snowstorms, plus more of the alien layer and less of the spaceship stuff. For a series with both slow time and kinesis abilities, the puzzles have just never lived up to expectations. There is so much you can do with just those two skills, and the game's only ever scratched the surface. Dead Space 3 somehow makes them even worse. The puzzles here are lacklustre and basically tell you the answer. There's one where you have to manage the pressure by turning a bunch of valves, except there are lights telling you exactly which valves to turn and when. The puzzle in the alien area late in the game just has you grab a relic and place it in the obviously marked order. I did like how there are a few different hacking minigames who aren't always doing the same thing to open doors. The variety keeps things from getting too tedious in that respect. Some of the minigames look like they were designed for two people, such as one where you have to move two dials into position or rotate blocks so that they fit together. I assumed initially that this was for co-op play, however after doing a bit of research it looks like even in co-op one person still does the puzzles by themselves and the other then just keeps them safe from a few extra enemies. I didn't bother with co-op myself. I don't enjoy it at the best of times and even less so when the game isn't actually good. I know some people will say they had fun playing with a friend or whatever, but that is a ridiculously low bar to clear, and I find it rarely means anything for the quality of the experience. Even playing solo you can see the co-op stuff pop up occasionally. There are set piece events like piloting the ship and shooting at the same time that are very clearly meant for co-op. Some optional missions are co-op only, and there's even a locked door literally marked co-op, which is a bit weird. If you need to climb up or down a cliff there are always two of the devices next to each other. Sometimes the game can't quite decide whether it's a single player game that you can play in co-op, or a co-op game that you can play single player. Isaac is still clearly the star of the show, so everything Carver does is effectively ignored, and he has to keep popping up in the cutscenes in single player to justify his existence in the co-op campaign. It's all really awkward. Fortunately there are some optional missions that you can play in single player. They're okay. I liked the one where a guy taunted Isaac over the speakers as he progressed, only for it to turn out that the messages had been pre-recorded and that he was long dead. Thing is, each optional mission plays out in a similar way, so there isn't much variety. There aren't any end bosses or big reveals. You just keep fighting waves of enemies and then at the end you find a loot crate with a bunch of resources. That said, those resources are worthwhile rewards because of the crafting system that's in place. The more you collect, the more weird and wonderful weapons you can build. Unsurprisingly, this is also where the microtransactions come in, but even without those, I don't think the crafting and resource gathering system is a great fit for this game. Generally, resource gathering as a thing is well overdone in games at the moment and has been for a while. Most open world games now have you collecting something like flowers for minor upgrades and it is so clearly busy work. However, in some settings and game styles, resource gathering is a good fit. For example, the Fallout games. You have limited gear, so you salvage what is available and make better gear. The more you explore, the better you get. That logic sounds like it could apply to Dead Space 3 as well. You don't have many toys to play with initially, and Isaac is an engineer who could make more if he had the resources. Likewise, the setting is not dissimilar to post-apocalypse. However, most horror games are far too linear for a system like this to really work. In Dead Space 3, you get resources by stomping on dead bodies. That's about it. 
you aren't really exploring or going to any effort. They're in the way, you have to practically walk over them. You have to make a conscious effort not to collect resources. That's presumably why we have optional missions. They are something that you have to make a conscious effort to do for resources. However, they are also substantial levels in their own right, so I did them more just to see the entire game than to gather stuff. And even within those levels, you're not exploring. You're picking up just everything that is in your way. Even if you don't use the microtransactions, and you certainly don't need to, there's just no escaping the conclusion that the entire system only exists because of microtransactions. And that is distracting. You don't want to think about even the existence of I don't know, EA's origin platform or marketplaces in general when you're trying to focus on a horror game. It's just not a good fit. The microtransactions and the pre-order bonuses cover the entire gambit of basic resources to suits to weapons to upgrades to the little scavenger bot you can send out during missions who looks for even more resources. It's all tacky as hell and, as we now know, it was only a sign of what was to come from EA. Mind you, I do like the N7 suit I was given as a reward for having played Mass Effect. As you can tell, I didn't like the action focus nor the microtransactions, but what I was most disappointed by was the complete disaster that is the story and characters. Dead Space 3 feels like it was written by a completely different team from the previous two. It's amateurish and quite often juvenile. I'm not saying the other two games were literary masterpieces or anything, but at the very least the characters felt like real people. The basic setup is that Isaac Clarke is in hiding from EarthGov because of the whole thing with them experimenting on him for information about the markers in Dead Space 2. Clarke's relationship with Ellie didn't last long and she moved on. Her new boyfriend, Robert Norton, pops up to ask Clarke for help. Ellie has gone missing on the planet Tau Volantis, which she believes is the marker homeworld. A division of the Church of Unitology, known as the Inner Circle, is also sniffing around and immediately tries to kill Clarke. The main story isn't all that interesting, and I say that as someone who is fairly invested in the whole marker thing at this point. In addition to these three games, I've read the two books, watched the two movies, and read some comics. I like the marker story, and when it does get room to breathe here, it is, once again, quite interesting. The problem is that Dead Space 3 doesn't care about the marker or larger story for long stretches of time. That bit doesn't really get going until three quarters of the way through, and even then it's handled terribly with aggressive info dumps where huge paragraphs of text appear on screen at once. Or it's just told through text logs, which is a shitty way to pay the whole thing off after so much build up. Instead of telling a story about the markers, Dead Space 3 focuses on the characters and a frankly pathetic love triangle. Norton brought Isaac on board to save Ellie, but then proceeds to constantly complain about Isaac's presence, despite Isaac clearly being the only one keeping them alive. You made us come down here. You encouraged her. Now look who we are. Between Dan and shooting at us and whatever the fuck that was, what chance have we got? Norton is a jealous teenager and clearly doesn't trust Ellie around Isaac. And he does have kind of a point there. Norton betrays the group to the unitologists, led by Danik of the Inner Circle, and then he goes a bit mad, forcing Isaac to kill him. Ellie is understandably angry and a bit suspicious that Isaac might have offed Norton for his own gain, and then she nearly kisses Isaac about 15 minutes later, so yeah. The characters are all over the place. One minute they are brave and the next they act like they didn't know they were investigating a dangerous alien planet. Santos, an engineer, gets particularly screwed over here and some of her lines are just terrible. Now there are only four of us left! I can't do this! Then we leave you behind! If you can't keep your head, you're a danger to everybody. You're Nobody's leaving anybody. Another team member, Carver, has the most WT fuck moment in the game. A few times Carver shows that he's one of those people who will make sacrifices for the greater good, especially when those sacrifices are other people and not himself. Okay, let's be polite and say he's pragmatic. He doubts himself near the end and has a great conversation with Isaac, where Isaac reassures him that he's done the right thing. It's probably my favourite moment of the game, and it's ruined shortly after because Carver took completely the wrong message from it. Right at the end, Carver gives up the codex to save Ellie, which is utterly against his established character. If there's one time he should have been pragmatic, it's right here. Ellie isn't quite the person she was in Dead Space 2 either, and I don't just mean the chest. I wouldn't go as far as to say she is damseled or anything, but her character is certainly less interesting and frankly a bit stupid. She also has a really silly fake death scene. The room is on fire and she can't get out in time. You have to close the door and leave her to die. The fire is indeed deadly. If you don't close the door quickly enough, it kills you. So it's impossible for Ellie to survive this. But she does. 
There's a great moment where you have to assemble the fossils of a being known as Rosetta. Ellie and Carver are then shocked to find that Rosetta is in fact an alien, as if that wasn't really obvious. I had to re-watch this scene because it was honestly too stupid to believe, and having now seen it a couple of times, I think Ellie's surprise is that it's not a necromorph. She doesn't think it's going to be a human. However, she is referring to it as a he or she, which is an odd way to refer to a necromorph. Anyway, perhaps this scene isn't as bad as I initially thought, however the writing just doesn't sell whatever it is they're doing. Rosetta's an alien. What? What does that mean? Very little of note happens until the final act. Ellie is on Tau Volantis because she believes it's the marker homeworld. A group of unitologists is also here. There's something called Rosetta, which contains information about a codex, which in turn unlocks something known as the Convergence. All nice and vague, lots of big important sounding nouns, that's about it. After putting Rosetta back together, Isaac is subjected to an info dump to end all info dumps. Basically, the aliens who used to live on this planet discovered a marker, much like the humans did on Earth. The marker led to a massive necromorph infestation, which eventually became big enough to trigger a convergence event. When this happens, the dead space zone around markers is switched off, and necromorphs gather around the marker which then sends their body mass into space to create a necromorph moon, also known as a brethren moon. The moon then sends a signal across space to other moons, which I think leads other civilizations to find and experiment on markers of their own, much like humans did after discovering the one on Earth. This in turn leads to more convergence events and more moons, which strengthens the signal. The aliens of this planet realised this would be a bad thing and they tried to stop convergence by freezing the planet. Danik and his crew of believers use the codex to turn off the machine that is keeping the planet cold, which restarts convergence. Isaac effectively fights a moon to get the codex back and reactivate the machine. He appears to die in the process as the moon crash lands back on the planet, however you hear his voice call out over a radio in the post credit scene. The DLC is probably more interesting than the base game because it plays with hallucinations and you never quite know what's real. By the end it looks like one of the Brethren moons is about to attack Earth, although given the whole hallucination vibes of the DLC there's no knowing what's real for sure. There's also this hilarious scene where what can only be described as a stealth moon pops out of nowhere in the closing cutscene. While I like the atmosphere of the DLC it's incredibly short at about an hour and it reuses the maps from the optional missions so I wouldn't say it's worth $10. I said earlier that I don't like the story in Dead Space 3, however that's not quite true. Perhaps it would be more accurate to say I don't like the storytelling. I hate the interactions between the main characters and I hate how information about the markers, aliens and convergence is handled through sloppy info dumps. But the whole convergence thing is interesting and it is genuinely epic both in terms of size and the time it takes to play out. Events around the markers and convergence take centuries to happen each time, and the same thing happens across the universe to loads of different species. Whoever is responsible for the markers is playing the longest of long games, and that contributes to this massive scale of the whole thing. This other race is not working on our timeline. They likely live a lot longer than humans, and we probably look insignificant by comparison. And for better or worse, we still don't really know what the end goal is. Does the other race just want to wipe out all other species? Will the moons be used as some sort of relay for transportation? It's not entirely clear, but I like to think that in Dead Space 4 or 5, the alien race would have made themselves known in some way. Of course, we'll likely never find out now. We don't know how many copies Dead Space 3 did sell, but it was definitely less than the target of 5 million, and it didn't justify the major changes EA forced on the franchise. Presumably every developer at Visceral spent an entire day muttering I fucking told you so under their breath. There will be no Dead Space 4. Right, never say never I guess, but it does seem highly unlikely that EA will ever revisit this series beyond maybe a VR game or something like that. After Dead Space 3, Visceral was tasked with making Battlefield Hardline, which I often forget exists. A team started work on a pirate themed game codenamed Jamaica. This was then cancelled because EA got the Star Wars license and Ubisoft came out with a pirate themed game of its own. Project Yuma, later Project Ragtag, was going to be a third person Star Wars game starring a group of scoundrels putting together a heist. You'd switch between characters to put the heist together, perhaps a little in the vein of Grand Theft Auto V. This project is not to be confused with Star Wars 1313 which had you playing as bounty hunters. Amy Hennig, the creative director of the first three Uncharted games plus the Soul Reaver games back in the day, was brought in to be project lead. From the outside, Ragtag looked set to succeed. 
the developers of Dead Space working with the creative director of the Uncharted games making a new Star Wars game sure sounded good on paper. So it was of course cancelled by EA, with CEO and known arsehole Andrew Wilson claiming ragtag didn't fit with market trends for what people wanted from a Star Wars game, because people don't want Star Wars stories about scoundrels getting together to pull off a heist apparently. Oh and let's not forget Visceral had the chance to carry on development of Star Wars 1313. The game was pitched to them by the previous team but was rejected outright, because no one cares about bounty hunters in Star Wars? Now obviously all this market trends nonsense was code for we don't want to make single player games that we can't monetize out the arse. And before anyone mentions them, don't think for one second we'd have microtransaction free versions of Jedi Fallen Order or Squadrons if it weren't for the Battlefront 2 fiasco. It's pretty ironic really. EA cancelled the single player Star Wars game it was making because it didn't see enough money in single player games. And then it desperately needed to make single player Star Wars games because it got a bollocking from Mickey Mouse. Good work EA. Ok this time there is a little more to the story than just hating on EA. As revealed in a Kotaku article written by Jason Schreier, development on Project Ragtag did not go smoothly. For one thing the game underwent a major change in direction after Hennig joined. Project Yuma as it was then called was going to be an open world space game, whereas she wanted to make a linear adventure. There were rumours of clashes between Hennig and the rest of the team, and apparently she wanted to micromanage everything. Visceral was a small studio by AAA standards and probably not big enough for a project like this one. Hennig was used to working with teams twice the size. Plus you have to get approval from Disney for every little thing. As per EA mandate, Visceral had to use the Frostbite engine which was not well suited to third person games. EA also didn't like the lack of traditional Star Wars elements in the game. It was constantly doing market research which unsurprisingly revealed that people associate Star Wars with Jedi, lightsabers and cool spaceships. That's why we now have Jedi Fallen Order and Squadrons. Those games were literally put into development because the marketing department ran a word association mini game and shock horror, lightsabers and X-Wings featured prominently. There was also that nonsense of an EA executive stating that FIFA Ultimate Team makes a billion dollars a year and expecting this game to have something like that. Morale at Visceral started to dip and lots of employees saw the writing on the wall and jumped before they were pushed. Visceral couldn't replace all the lost staff directly with EA wanting to direct new recruits to cheaper locations like Montreal, whereas Visceral was in expensive San Francisco. Overall development sounds like a nightmare and the game progressed incredibly slowly. One employee described the closure of Visceral as a mercy killing and said the game would never have been good. Reading the Schreier article again, yeah, he may well have been right. Mistakes were clearly made within Visceral games, but you know what, I still blame EA here. Sure, EA is an easy target, but sometimes the easy target is still the right one. EA didn't have to give the massive Star Wars game to a relatively small studio. It didn't have to demand that the game have the equivalent of a gravity gun to make it stand out, or a recurring revenue stream that would make a billion dollars a year. It didn't need to hire a creative director known for making linear adventure games, and then act all surprised when it turned out she wanted to make a linear adventure game. It didn't have to constantly butt in and ask stupid questions like where's Chewbacca or demand there be more Star Wars in the Star Wars game just because a marketing team needed to keep themselves busy. The failure of Project Ragtag was a failure of EA to effectively manage its own teams and projects. It was not a failure of the developers making the game. So of course those developers lost their jobs while the executives who made terrible decision after terrible decision got rewarded with obscene amounts of money for discovering loopholes in gambling laws. Visceral didn't choose to make the version of Dead Space 3 that we ultimately got. It didn't ask to make Battlefield Hardline, and it wasn't allowed to make the Star Wars game it wanted to make. A publisher the size of EA never needs to close a studio, and it certainly doesn't need to fire everyone involved when it does. These are choices made to slightly improve the bottom line and fund even more extravagant executive pay, and to hell with the people who lose their jobs. God this shit is depressing. Anyway, if Dead Space returns at all, I'm guessing it'll be in the form of a VR spin-off and I can't imagine that will give us any satisfying closure here. I also have to give Visceral props for seemingly planning much of the story at the start which should be standard practice but unfortunately isn't. Not every problem with Dead Space 3 can be directly blamed on EA, at least not without more insider information about development. Even with the switch to an action focus and the addition of microtransactions, you still have the worst writing in the series to contend with. And as harsh as it sounds, there were probably other studios that could have made the action play better here. Still, as I said, it was EA that insisted on forcing the square peg through the round hole in the first place. 
Effectively utilizing people and resources is a huge part of project management, and time and time again EA has failed at that most basic of requirements. Looking at the bigger picture, Dead Space as a franchise feels like a huge missed opportunity. I know there's a lot of reverence for this series. Some people hold the first two games out as masterpieces, and presumably some people even like this one, but I don't think any of the games quite nail what they were going for. Dead Space 1 was a solid horror game with a lot of promise. Dead Space 2 couldn't quite decide if it wanted to be horror or action, and ended up being neither. Dead Space 3... happened. I can't help but wonder how differently things might have turned out if Visceral had been allowed and even encouraged to keep making actual horror games. Between Dead Space 1 and 2 there were plenty of good horror moments. Combine the best bits of those two games, work on level design a little more, and voila you have a horror classic. Oh well, it wasn't meant to be I guess. Alright that's it from me today, I still owe you all a video on Deus Ex Mankind Divided so that's up next. After that I'll probably keep going with the isometric CRPG series and get videos out as often as I can. In case you missed the news, I'm going to treat this channel more as a hobby than a job going forward. It simply hasn't been successful enough to justify working on it full time. If that ever changes, I assure you I'll jump back on it with a passion. If you'd like to support the channel financially then Patreon is a great place to do that. I will never charge for months where I don't put out a video, and sometimes I won't charge even if I do. Depends on the video. You can also hang out in my Discord server or watch me stream games on Twitch. The Twitch streams are pretty low key, just a way for me to catch up on games I haven't played really. Okay, until next time, cheers.